edition of the Pandemic Survival Guide for Residential Contractors. We are in our 14th uh, series of doing this, uh, dating all the way back to March. So we have made it to the middle of July. Congratulations for all of you that have made it along with us. And thank you again for joining us for another edition. For those of you that are new to our show, my name is Ed Earl. I'm coming to you from beautiful San Diego, California. Uh, we were on a call the other day with one of my coaching clients, and we were all talking about our weather. And I said, well, you know, it's really not any different in San Diego. I mean, we have good weather all year round. Yeah. So anyway, I run a construction project management company down here in San Diego where I serve as an owner's rep. I am also a partner in residential contractor services group with these two gentlemen that uh, we have on our webinar with us today. I'm going to turn it over to our international correspondent, Paul Sanneman. I'm, I'm here in COVID-free Friendland, right? So um, I've been doing this for, as I said, you know, what is it, 35 years? I'm in Finland right now because we have a house in Finland. Finland's a great place to be at the moment because there's no COVID, no civil distress. It's a cool place. And it's interesting. I, I told the people here, you know, I could spend the rest of the year in Finland, but I went, weather, COVID, weather, COVID. Yeah, I'll go with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I'm David Luperger. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. As um, a friend is uh, fond of saying, I'm a recovering remodeler. Did it for over 25 years. Like Ed and Paul, work with contractors around the country, just reviewing best practices, profitability. And we found that the three of us have some very complementary skill sets, which is why we work with you. It's why we, we host these webinars. So let's get started, Ed. All right. Well, it sounds good, David. Yeah, as as, uh, as David said, we've been hosting these webinars really as a resource for for all of all of you out there that attend. We talk to about 50 uh, plus residential contractors every week, all of our various coaching clients. So we're really up to speed on what's going on in each of the various submarkets. And in a tumultuous time like we're in right now, things change constantly. And we're always not only sharing our own perspectives, but we're learning some really good best practices from many of our clients as well. And so actually today, we're fortunate to have two of our, our coaching clients joining us, and they're going to actually share some uh, new insights that they have and how they've changed their sales presentation in response to the pandemic and how, how well that has worked for them. So um, as I always like to do when we start off, uh, I'm going to start with a, a, a little joke for the week. So here's the one for this week. It's another Saturday night in the house, and I just realized that even the trash goes out more than me. But I'm from drum roll, right? But a boom, yeah. But a boom. So uh, we're gonna actually switch things up a little bit this week. So typically in the past, we cover all of the, the aid updates from the PPP program and the EIDL. And there are some updates this week, but we're gonna save that until the end of the presentation. And we're gonna jump right into the meat of this week's webinar, and it's talking about how the pandemic has really changed how we make sales presentations. And now we all know that that's true, obviously. Uh, you can't just, you're not going to sit down with a couple like what we show here in this picture. But what we didn't realize is that in many ways, it's made it easier if you understand the circumstances. So the first thing we need to look at is the fact that now pretty much wherever you go, especially if you're in someone's home, you have to wear a mask. So we started realizing that that really provides some real fundamental um, hurdles that you have to overcome. And it's based on our view in American society of who wears masks, right? So let's look. I mean, in the past, before pre-COVID, who wore masks? Well, bank robbers, they wore masks, right? Who else? Anyone else? David, Paul, give me a suggestion. Uh, How about <laughs> villains, right? Do we, have any Batman, uh, do we have any Batman fans out there? You might recognize this villain from one of the Batman movies. Who else wears masks? Sick people, yeah. right? Sick people yeah. wear masks. So the fact of the matter is that in, in American society, yeah, masks also, are not a symbol of trust. Yes, Paul. Right. And also old people wear masks. I mean, it is, it is not a symbol of youth and health, right? Right. It's true. And nor is it a symbol of, of really of trusting people. And I think that's really the key here. So, you know, when you look at this picture of this guy with a mask on, do you feel like you could trust him? I mean, you're not instantly gravitated to him. If all I did was remove that mask and you see he's got a warm smile on his face, 
it changes things. So what we have found is that initiating trust in a relationship is very difficult when you have a mask on. And it's actually now harder to initiate trust in person than it is face to face, but remotely. So what in the past we always would say, you know, look, only make the presentations in person that you want to close. We don't always tell our coaching clients that, right? Basically make all of your presentations in person. But now what's happened is after the pandemic, we now are telling our clients, look, never make your presentations in person. And it's actually better to be face to face over Zoom than it is to be in person and covered with a mask, right? So again, you look at those two pictures there, you have the three people talking with masks on versus, you know, the person sitting in their, their, their own home like we are here without masks on. Yes, Paul. And Ed, you also have the very socially uncomfortable position of knowing whether the mask is okay or not, because some people like masks, some people don't. And when you're in that situation, when you first start out and you're meeting with somebody, you don't know whether, like, should you shake hands or not? Should you stay away or not? And it, it creates this literally social distancing, which is not good for sales. And when you're talking to a person, it, you, you got to sort of figure out, well, can I take off my mask? Or are they going to be offended? Or should I get close to them and be offended? And it's very uncomfortable to be in the presence of a new person when you don't know their beliefs and makeup and how they feel about this whole COVID thing. You don't want to do anything any politically incorrect. And it's, you start off in a very uncomfortable position, which doesn't happen if you do it over Zoom or some other means of um, video. Right, yeah. And then you've got this whole thing going on. Maybe you wear the mask, then you pull it down, and then you put it back up. And yeah, it gets very, very complicated. So, all right. So we're kind of, we're going to move on here. A little here. surreal, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, right? Exactly. We're actually going to bring on a couple of our clients, uh, Roger Thomas. Let's find Roger. We're going to have Roger share with you how uh, he has changed his um, he has changed his uh, approach given uh, what we've just discussed. So let me I, see, Roger. I just I'm unmuting him as we speak. Okay. Perfect. Great. Huh. Get Roger on. It says attendee is self muted. Oh, Roger, are you are you muted? Unmute yourself. How's that? Oh, there now he's ready. He's ready. Hey, he's here. Hey, Roger. All right. Well, hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and, and just uh, to recap briefly what uh, Ed, Paul, and I spoke about uh, the other day and how I have managed uh, my business is. I, I found someone who was very good at sales, who was outside of my area. And by outside, I mean hundreds of miles outside. So it really wasn't going to fit for me until COVID came along. And, you know, despite all, all the, the, the bad things that it brings, a few of the good things that it's brought for me is nobody thinks anything about having a virtual person attend a meeting. I'm in Southern Utah, so we're, um, not on big lockdown. I still meet with my clients frequently face to face, but I also have a large TV sitting uh, on an adjacent desk where um, Jen, who is my sales and design person, uh, sits and she attends all of these meetings via Zoom and it is seamless and flawless and we're able to conduct business as if she were sitting there. There is no hesitancy, no awkward look by the clients of how come you have, you know, someone who isn't in the room attending the meeting. And what that's allowed me to do is I found the best person, the right person for the position in my business, regardless of where they're physically located. And now they are absolutely positively contributing to my business. It took us about a week to get it figured out and set up. And in the last two weeks, using this model, uh, we, we've closed two new deals uh, as a direct result of having um, a competent salesperson involved in those meetings. Now, I would also like to add, Rhett, Roger, those are the first two deals you've closed this year, unless I'm, am I correct? Uh, you're correct, but you didn't need to share that, Paul. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, Roger, what was the size of those deals? 
Uh, one is going to be, uh, so I'm in a, um, our, our houses cost less than the national average here. So one sure. is a, um, it's a second home. It'll be six seventy five, seven hundred thousand. Um, it's a passive house. Uh, another one is going to be three seventy five to four twenty five, right, right in that range. But we're still saying you you're closing six figure deals through virtual meetings. Absolutely, and not yeah. only am I closing them, but they're going amazingly smooth and and flawlessly. Great. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much, Roger, for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and uh, thank you for for sharing sharing your experiences. You bet. Thank you so, for having. Me. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Roger. Have a good weekend. All right, we're going to move on to another one of our clients, uh, Cassidy. Cassidy's uh, up in Northern California, and uh, with a company called TC Construction, and he is the C in the TC Construction. So let's find Cassidy Monson. I am. I've got a self muted on Cassidy also. So, all right. At attendee is self muted. Cassidy. Let's see if we get Cassidy going here. Cassidy, are you? Oops, I thought the green for a second there. There, oh, there he is. Cassidy, you're on. Hmm. Vic Ron. I think we're on. Wow. All right. Yeah, now he's off. Now he's back on. Let's do this. Uh, I'm going to move on to our third uh, case study, which actually she couldn't join us. Her name is um, Gina. Cassidy, if we can get you unmuted, uh, just... Um, Please just chirp in while we're while we're talking here, and we will switch back to you, Cassidy. But uh, uh, the uh, hey, let's see. Are you there, Cassidy? I see it green. Ah, can't get him. All right, Paul. While so, we're waiting, do you want to tell Gina's story? Well, well, Gina. One of the, Gina had an interesting story. She used to spend a lot of time driving around Portland, and I said. I told her, I said, you're really wasting your time, you know, qualifying leads by showing up. And I remember we had that defining moment when it was like, I don't know, five in the evening and she was going to take an hour to get there. And I said, Gina, do not drive across Portland. It is a waste of your time. And so she said, no, no, I got to go. So she literally drove across there. It was an entire waste of her time. And she wasted like her whole evening. And she goes, okay, I'm done. I get it. So we developed a protocol where in her case, the first appointment is is screened by somebody on the phone. She does again. They do remodels between fifty and probably two hundred fifty thousand, about four four or five million or something like that. So, um, and she is the salesperson, and we've changed that now. There's a couple more, but for intensive purpose, she was a salesperson. So now what she does is somebody screens a call. She takes the first call on the phone, and then she sets up an appointment. The next appointment, she has a client takes pictures, and she does a second appointment on the phone. And again, she's looking at the client's pictures and maybe doing Zoom and figuring out meeting with the person and does what she normally did in her first appointment entirely on the phone. And then by the time she's done her third appointment, which she will do in person, the person's expecting to write her a check. So she no longer, I mean, right now, every appointment she goes on, she gets a check. She no longer goes on any appointments where she doesn't get paid. And it's all done on the phone. It's worked out really well for her. And she spends, I mean, I, I don't know, 20% of the time she used to spend because every time she meets with somebody, it's on the phone, it takes 30, 40 minutes. She does everything from her office. And the one, one two times she does go out, she always gets a check. So it's a much better process. And I'm sure a lot of our clients out there can implement the same thing. Great. Cassidy, it looks like we've got a green microphone. Cassidy, can, you, can we hear you? Huh. Wow. Are you, uh, David, are you seeing a green green microphone? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I'm seeing it now. It just went red again now. So uh, hmm. it must be technology is great when it works, but every now yep. and again. So, Ed, right. you want to give Cassidy's story since he's not going to give his own? Gosh. Yeah. So Cassidy basically t told us that he is not – here's Cassidy. Sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. 
So Cassidy basically said, look, you know, a similar story to Gina, where he said, look, I would do, you know, most of my, my sales presentations in person. He said, now I don't do any of my sales presentations in person. My standard procedure is that I do all of my presentations through Zoom. People now expect that. Um, I'm able to share my screen. I, we go through the presentation. We can see each other face to face. We actually interact better because we can see each other. I can read their expressions. And uh, so he's just, again, and changed his whole presentation. And like Gina, is so much more efficient because unlike, you know, having to drive all over the Bay Area and fight that traffic, he now can do so many more sales calls and has actually been, I think, more effective in closing his sales calls as well. Right. So. And I would add to that that, now, I mean, you used it, you'd have to drive over to the person, which could take anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. You got to park, got to go up to their office, like a meeting the architect, got to meet that's and everything I drive. So it could take four hours, easy, for one appointment, plus mess yep. up your entire day. You now can do the exact same appointments probably in 35 minutes or so. So that allows you to do, you know, at least four times the same amount of sales appointments in the same period of time. And especially with dealing with architects, and we can, we're gonna cover that in our next webinar, um, it's all about numbers. If you can meet four architects a week, you do four times better if you meet one. And the big problem we had in the past was it was just really hard to break up your day and drive across town and meet this person someday went there, you had to take them to lunch, which takes even longer. It was very, very difficult. Now you can do everything from your office, it takes 20 or 30 minutes, and there's no reason why you can't meet, you know, if you're doing this kind of marketing, four or five new architects a week. And we've had guys literally close million dollar deals on the phone, having never actually met the person in person and had them give the check, the deal sealed, and they never actually have met the person in person. So it's way easier than it used to be. So COVID has improved one thing. Well, Roger yeah. basically said he just signed a million dollars worth of work using oh, Cassidy. Cassidy. Cassidy, I'm sorry. No, that was Roger, the first, our first person. No, no, but this is Cassidy, the one that couldn't, that couldn't come through. He's saying that he's actually on a $1.4 million job site right now that he sold on Zoom. So I'll be. Cassidy says, sorry, guys. Uh, I, I couldn't have said it better. Thanks, Ed and Paul. And then his last comment, which is true. You guys should be using Zoom, so uh, which is uh, uh, yeah we're both uh, are, are we, we're sponsored by a go to webinar, so we can't talk too bad sparingly about them, but uh, yeah, no use Zoom when you can. So all right, Cassidy, well thank you for being here in spirit. Sorry we couldn't hear your voice. Uh, Elena also made a, a comment which I thought was was great. You have a good weekend too, Cassidy. Uh, Elena says we always wear patterned masks like cats or horses to lighten the mood and make people more comfortable with us wearing them. And so I think that's a, that's a, good, a good approach too. So if you do have to wear a mask, I have that a would be a fun clients. I have a couple of clients that they have the t-shirts, the hats, and the mask all have the logo on it. I have a right. client that has probably 300 framers who work with him. And everybody wears a logoed mask when they're on the job. Right. It's a nice little touch we gotta wear one, right? Yeah, exactly. You know what I've been looking for? I want a mask that like has a little smile face, you know? So it'd be because like, you know, when I smile and people think I'm frowning or something. I don't know. Anyway, anyone has a good smile face mask, let me know. All right. So let's move on here. We're going to try to keep it to our 30 minutes as we always do. Uh, let's move on to our, our section. I now am calling free money for contractors. So uh, we're going to give you the updates on the payroll protection plan, the economic injury disaster loan and other pandemic aid programs. So first, uh, let's talk about the PPP program. As you probably all know by now that on the 4th of July, President Trump extended the PPP loan program from June 30th to August 8th. But as you probably have read, now there's talk of extending that even beyond August 8th because the latest I've read is there's still about $130 billion left in that PPP program. So. Um, back on June 18th, the, uh, the Congress passed this prioritized paycheck protection program to extend, uh, actually allow people to apply for a second PPP. 
that I haven't read anything new on. But last night I was just doing my latest research and found this from the Motley Fool saying, will there be a second round of PPP loans? Lawmakers say yes. So, um, so anyway, this is uh, from that same uh, Motley, Motley Fool's article. So what's interesting is they're saying, yes, there will be a second PPP round, but qualifying for those loans may not be as easy the second time around as it was the first time. So really, they want businesses that, uh, to apply that have really shown a steady decline in revenue from previous levels. So any remaining PPP money will really be targeted towards those struggling businesses. Now, fortunately for all of us here, we're in an industry that hasn't been as badly affected, right? If we were in the hospitality business or restaurants or conventions or transportation and travel, it would be a different story. But fortunately, I mean, our experience, again, with our contractors, 50 plus nationwide, Pretty much, I would say, Paul and David, wouldn't you agree, pretty much everyone is doing at least as good, if not better, than they were pre-COVID. Everybody's busy. Right. I would say pretty much better. I mean, my, I mean, there was, a, there was a lull for a while when the first yeah. COVID hit, but yeah. over the, certainly the last month, the month of July, all of our clients have been setting records as far as, you know, what they've been doing production-wise. So it's just been, it's amazing and you know i don't know how yeah. it's gonna last but it's doing yeah. really really right exactly so also in this same article they talked about this blanket forgiveness for the ppp loans uh, i want to share with you this uh, email i got from my my bank who i have my ppp loan with the bank of southern california so they said that they are working on a one-page forgiveness application um, where basically borrowers that have under $150,000 or less in a PPP loan, it's a one-page form. You basically just check a, bu a bunch of boxes and you self-certify it, which means you don't have to submit any 941s, any payroll tax returns, none of that. You just basically say, yes, I used the money for these reasons. I didn't lay anyone off and that's it. So Bank of Southern California is saying, hey, we're, that's why we're holding off. We're not sending you anything on the loan forgiveness side because we're waiting to see if this gets passed. So if it doesn't, say, then we'll send out the, the form. But, the longer you wait on this one, the better off you are, I think. Right. I agree. Yeah, mm. I think that's, that's definitely true. So, all right. So let's move on now to the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Let's raise your hands if you've received approval notifications in the last two weeks. I saw Jonathan, Jonathan's hand, I knew his would go up as the very first one. Daniel, all right, well, Miriam, Peter, wow, okay, we've got a lot of them. So uh, yeah. Jonathan's one of our clients that he actually was uh, emailing David and I this morning, uh, wondering whether he should take the EIDL loan, which is a very good question. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the EIDL. So I uh, applied for an EIDL myself and um, I got contacted a phone call from the SBA because I had never completed it because I wasn't sure I wanted to take it. And I got a phone call, surprisingly, uh, now two phone calls from two different people from the SBA uh, answering my questions, wanting to know if I had any other information I wanted to know. And I actually got this email just the other day in response. So this is a key thing too, as you might all recall, originally with the EIDL, there was this grant part of it, right? It was $1,000 per employee up to $10,000 that you could get for free and you wouldn't have to pay that back. Well, this is something I didn't know until I got this email. As of July 11th, so what was that? Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, yeah, a week ago Saturday, the EIDL advance request program became fully allocated. So they don't have any more of that advance money. So I don't know. Let's uh, let's 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 lower everyone's hand. For those of you that um, got your EIDL approval, how many of you got that advance? How many of you actually got that that money up front? So, all right. Wow, Derek, Der Elena, Derek, Mary, Elena, Miriam, Miriam, Sherry. Todd. But not Jonathan. That is interesting. All right, Jonathan. Well, we'll we'll hook, we'll circle back with you later to see when you actually um, applied for that. But 
Um, it says here, if the SBA was able to process your request before the advanced funding ran out, you will receive a direct deposit in your bank account that you provided as part of your application. So Jonathan, if you applied before July 11th, you should still be seeing that money coming in. And if it's like what I experienced, and I think Paul, for you as well, it just shows up in your bank account. You don't get a confirmation email. There's no not, no notice about it. It just it just it just shows up. So that's the EIDL grant part of it. Now the loan part of it, as it says here in this same uh, email, that has continued, and applications are still being processed, even though the advance is no longer available. So what I decided to do is the key. One of the key things with the EIDL is that loans over twenty five thousand are collateralized. Now, Jonathan and I had this discussion about this morning, and Jonathan said, well, that doesn't bother me that much. It's, you know, it's basically like a home mortgage, right? As a matter of fact, probably even less than that. And that's true. And I think this is really where it just comes down to it's a personal decision each of you need to make. If you're okay uh, getting a collateralized loan, um, then I would say go ahead and do it. Um, one of our clients said, well, what I did was I just adjusted my loan down to 25000 and that way I don't have to worry about the collateralized loan. And so that's what I've decided to do as well. So I went in to my web on my website and what I've done now is I've selected the $25,000 loan. Notice the loan disclosures down here. This is something that I think is interesting I didn't know. So loan security requirement. If it's under 25,000, it's an unsecured loan. If it's between 25,000 and $1 to 200,000, the loan is secured with all business assets. If it's over $200,000, then the loan is secured with all personal assets and they ask you to sign a personal guarantee. So I didn't know about the personal guarantee debt. So I don't know if any of you have the over two, if you've gotten over 200,000 in the EIDL, but you've got that as well. So I'm gonna tell you one other thing, which is totally, this is just me off the top of my head, but I'm kind of thinking that maybe if this thing goes far enough, they may take an approach kind of like they've done with the PPP loan where they simplify the forgiveness. And they might just say, you know what? It's going to be too much trouble to try and get all these people that have borrowed 25000 or less. We don't have any collateral anyway. Let's just forgive those loans that are 25000 and under. So my decision was I'm going to take that $25,000 loan it's $78 a month in interest. I'm not sure I'm going to need it, but I might. And so for 78 bucks a month, I'm going to keep that loan for the next 12 months, see what happens on the forgiveness front, see what happens with my business. I feel like it's just great to have that 25000 sitting in my account if I need it. I don't have to pay the interest on it. I know it's accruing the interest. And that's the other thing I want to clarify, that even though you don't have to pay any interest during that 12-month period, the interest does still accrue. So anyway, so that's the, that's the information on that. This is a really great chart that compares the two between the EIDL and the PPP for those of you that are trying to compare between them. Um, and, uh, but definitely for those of you that maybe have the EIDL, if you haven't applied for the PPP, as long as you've got some employees, um, you should apply. And even if you are self-employed, um, as like, or, or Jonathan, I know you just have, I think, one employee. You can still apply for the PPP for yourself as a sole proprietor for the two and a half months of your payroll and basically get it forgiven. So, you know, the PPP money is still out there. So for those of you that haven't yet applied for the PPP, even if you've gotten the EIDL, I would highly encourage you to uh, apply for the PPP. All right, the last update for this week is you probably have heard uh, Congress is back in session. The uh, Republicans and Democrats have been going back and forth with the stimulus package. They were going to try and pull it off this week, but of course they couldn't do it. So it's supposed to be coming out on Monday. Now, this was a Forbes article that came out yesterday. And what they're expecting is that we are going to get another set of stimulus checks. So that same $1,200 stimulus check that came out last time, it looks like everyone is going to get that again. Um, but it's under the same qualifications as before. So if you are married, filed jointly, and you made 
filed more than 150,000 in adjusted gross income, you won't get a stimulus check. And if you're an individual filer and it was over 75,000, you also won't get a stimulus check. But if you're my son who works at Taco Bell and made like, I don't know, $4,000 last year, he will get another $1,200 stimulus check. So thank you very much. Um, can I ask it? Can I ask a quick e EIDL question? Yeah, this is intriguing. Yeah. yeah. Can I take my? This is from Mike. Can I take my EIDL money and invest it in an index fund or invest it somewhere? No, you can't. So it's very clear um, that it says specifically, and this was actually something that Jonathan sent me this morning. You cannot use it to purchase property. You can't use it to uh, buy. Uh, like lots, if you were a developer, you can't use the money for that. And and I'm sure that if you can't use it to buy lots, even if you're a in a real estate developer or builder, you can't use it to to go invest in stock. So um, yeah, good. So on the unemployment benefit side of things, we've all had this discussion. I know many of our clients um, are actually worse off because of this $600 a week. Uh, unemployment because it's basically a disincentive for their employees to come back to work. So um, fortunately, at least the Republicans seem to have understood that that is a, a disincentive. And so what they're now doing is instead of the $600 flat across the board, which was silly, my, my niece uh, is kind of like just, my, my, my son. Yeah. 68%, I think that's the last number, made more on unemployment than they made wow. when they were Wow, 68%, yeah. And I, it, my, my niece is one of those. And uh, so what they've done now, which totally makes sense, is it's now based on what your wage was. So they're going to pay you 70% of whatever your wages was, which they're thinking would equate to two to $300 per week. But that makes so much more sense. It should be a percentage of whatever you were making, not yeah. just a blanket I, I, $600. Yeah. Yeah. How are they possibly going to figure out those numbers? They have a hard enough time figuring out everything else. How are they going to figure out what everybody made and what 70% of that is and how to allocate a different dollar amount to like 23 million people? Well, when or you they file just... for unemployment, yeah, when you file for unemployment, it's, it's a factor of what you've made. So I think they're going to just have to use the same calculations that they currently use for their unemployment statements. I mean, this is from the feds. So I'm going yeah. on record saying I don't think the paperwork's going to work because every, I mean, I was looking at the difference. Washington, D.C., unemployment is $485 a week on the average. In, um, I think it was like Oklahoma, it's $58. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So every state is different, everything. And they're going to have to calculate that with like 23 million people. Good luck. Yeah. 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 The other idea that I did like too is that they're talking about doing a $450 a week return to work bonus. So they'll actually pay you for going back to work. So that's, that's a good idea as well. So anyway, all right. Well, folks, we have uh, reached the end of another one of our webinar series. So I uh, want to thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, please reach out, call us, or email us. I'm going to put our contact information up here again. David and Paul and I uh, reply to every email, answer every phone call. Uh, oftentimes, we're on coaching calls, so you just have to leave us a message. But those are our personal uh, cell phone numbers there, so please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, just as a reminder, you know, I'm sure we're going to have uh, new updates in, in two weeks on the um, on the situation with the PPP programs and the EIDL. Also, Paul is going to be sharing with us uh, a new approach for marketing with architects. Do you want to talk I, about that? I feel like a personal trainer. Everybody that followed my diet and exercise program got healthier, right? So, oh, I have developed a program over the years of how to get work from architects. It works 100% of the time. It's never missed. I've used it for hundreds and hundreds of clients. So, and it has to be totally modified depending on the company. Now it's got to be totally modified because of the whole COVID thing. So I will share the secret sauce with next, it's going to be a webinar all about that. And if you want to get all the work you want to get from architects, attend this webinar. And by the end of that webinar, you'll know exactly how to do it. And it won't cost you anything but time. 
That's all a right. good offer. There you go. There you go. So thank you all for joining us, and we will see you again on August 7th uh, for our webinar with uh, featuring Paul and getting all the work you can from Architect. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Have a good weekend. See you in a couple weeks. Bye-bye.